tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Well, hey there, friend. I hope you all had a nice fourth. Now, I know you'd like to hear me complain about the weather and all that like I usually do, but let's skip the small talk because it's been a good two months since we've heard from Skeeter and Yancey, and that's plenty of time for those two to get into some more trouble. I know, buddy. Chester loves Lynn Jenkins, but you'll have to listen on the podcast, same as everyone else. Come on in, friend. We've got work to do. Have a seat. Now, just be a second. Hmm. All right. So, you might remember this author from Season 2, Episode 2, The Call of the Tennessee Hawkcat. The story New York Times book review called Honey Mustard Dipping Sauce for the Soul. <sighs> no kidding. I mean, I don't read that rag, but Jeff told me, so it must be true. Alright friends, smoke them if you've got them and drink those glasses to the bottom because your old buddy Drew Blood has a tale to tell. But first, the rigmarole. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. You'll get instant access to the whole enchilada including hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012. Thank you for your support. Got a story or two you'd like to hear on this show? Send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, we'll do business. Tonight we're joined by Lynn Jenkins, oil hand, wordsmith, and never above a fart joke. So without further delay, I give you from author Lynn Jenkins... Skeeter and Yancey versus the Greys. Skeeter twisted the top off another cold one and propped his foot on the cooler. It had been a long day of branding and vaccinating cows, and now that he finally had a chance to sit down, the old bod felt like it had been run through the squeeze chute for the full treatment. It made him feel a little better seeing his old pal Yancey grimace as he stretched out his own kinks. You gonna make it, old man? He asked, passing Yancey another bottle. Yeah, but I might have to get James and Abe to pack me in the house. The four men sat on their lawn chairs in the middle of Skeeter's yard, watching satellites and shooting stars streak across the night sky. They talked about all the shit drunk friends talk about after a long day. Hell, James even had a story or two. Oh, look at that one, Abe said, pointing at an extra bright fallen star that almost hit the ground before burning itself out. Yancey pulled the phone out of his pocket and checked the time. Whoa, one thirty. He finished off the bottle he'd been nursing and sat it on the ground next to the row of empties. He was about to ask the brothers which one of them was going to have the honor of driving him home when Abe, pointing to the northern sky, said, What the hell is that? Skeeter clutched the armrests on his chair and gasped. Oh, shit, it's my ex-wife! then reached up for a high five that Yancey missed by about six inches, nearly falling off his chair. Abe stood, focusing his bewildered gaze into the distance. Then James rose and stood beside his brother, staring intently toward the northern skyline. Skeet stood and steadied himself till the ground stopped shaking, then helped Yancey to his feet. They stood on opposite sides of the Peruvian ranch hands, each resting a hand on the slightly shorter men's shoulders to keep from toppling over. Okay, Yancey said. I spy with my little eye. 
Abe pointed again, and Yancey, using an unsteady finger, traced an imaginary line from Abe's elbow to his finger and beyond, until they were both pointing at the same vanishing point in the inky black sky. What the hell is that? Abe already asked that, Skeeter said, and the pie-eyed foursome watched in silent amazement as five flickering lights in the far-off distance multiplied again and again. Over the span of a few minutes, the uniform horizontal formation of a few lights had slowly and steadily transformed into a large triangle, comprised of more than a dozen lights, some alternating colors from white to blue and others from red to orange, while still others remained a constant green. Uh, hey, Skeet, Yancey said, breaking the trance. Yeah? Uh, you remember that Laser Floyd concert? Smart ass. I ain't being funny. Uh, I think this must be some kind of a light show. James, usually the silent one of the bunch, spoke up. This doesn't look like any light show I ever saw. Maybe it's the Air Force flying drones or something, Abe suggested. All I know, Skeeter said with mock indignation, is the first one of you peg lickers that says UFO is going home without his pants. Uh, Skeet, Abe said. Yeah? Uh, Joe just said UFO. Skeeter thought about it. Well, shit, he huffed, and the britches came off. James, still watching the lights, wearily asked, So, what do you think they are? Since Yancey was the only one who hadn't yet hazarded a guess, he decided it was about time to offer up a little sage advice that his Uncle Brent had passed down to him. He cleared his throat and proclaimed to one and all, <coughs> Ask me no questions and I'll tell you no lies. If you ever get hit with a bucket of shit, be sure and close your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> this got laughs from Abe and Skeeter, but James didn't even seem to register. He just stared at the lights, apprehension growing with each passing minute. James, Yancey said. Yancey, James replied, still not taking his eyes off the lights. Yeah, you want us to throw a blanket over you and leave you here? James's usual carefree demeanor was nowhere to be found. His expression was stubbornly set, and he spoke with an uncharacteristic intensity. It's good that you are having fun, amigo, but there is something that you don't know. Yancey studied the younger man's careworn face as James continued. I have seen these lights before, amigo, in my village when I was a boy. The lights came out of the north just like these ones, and we were all very excited. We thought it was a good sign, but then the animals started dying in terrible ways, and the people started disappearing in the night. Then the lights stopped coming, and the village returned to normal. The four men watched the lights, not a sign of expression between them. After a few more minutes had passed, the outer lights flickered and went out, then the next row, and the next, until the sky was again a black void, save for the flashes of distant lightning. Skeeter pulled up his pants. <laughs> Looks like rain, he said, turning to the house. Good night, boys. Abe slid in behind the steering wheel of the side-by-side. -side. James took the shotgun, and Yancey sprawled out in the bed, letting his legs dangle over the tailgate. They cut through Skeeter's east pasture that connected with Yancey's west pasture, and barely made it home before the storm hit, and it was a doozy. Yancey's head no more than hit the pillow when he found himself in a Peruvian jungle dressed in olive green cargo pants, a sleeveless shirt, and Kevlar vest. In his right hand, he held an M16 that seemed insignificant compared to his bulging bicep, and in his left hand, he carried a survival knife with a heavy 20-inch blade that he wielded with ease. As he hacked his way through the thick undergrowth, a torrential rainstorm blew in from the north, instantly drenching him in a freezing deluge. He raised his arm to protect his face as the vines and branches lashed out in the wind. Suddenly, a shimmering image blurred past, and he awoke with a convulsive jerk only to find the curtains whipping violently in the wind. 
He rolled out of bed, still feeling the effects of the alcohol, and leaning into the wind, pushed his way to the window. He slammed it shut and rested against the frame, catching his breath. A bolt of lightning flashed nearby, and Yancey could have sworn he caught a glimpse of a human figure standing in the driveway. He pressed his forehead to the glass, intensifying his gaze. Another flash of lightning illuminated the driveway in a momentary dull blue luster. There was no one in the driveway, of course. Yancey passed it off as one too many beers at Skeet's place and went back to bed. In the days that followed the storm system, the vibrant colors of spring began to replace the tawny pallor of winter. The lambs romped freely in the south pasture, and the mysterious lights in the northern sky were mostly forgotten. One particularly fine Sunday morning, Skeeter swung by and picked up Yancey and the Olevis brothers, and headed into town for coffee at the gateway. Skeeter told himself he liked the Gateway Cafe more than the other places in town because, A, it was off the beaten path, so it was mostly locals that congregated there for eats and gossip, and B, Lana Franson, a.k.a. the hostess with the mostest waitress there every Sunday morning. But if Skeeter was being honest, the Gateway was a run-down shithole. The coffee was as thick as mud, and the old geezers who were always there hated him ever since he said Massey Ferguson's were better tractors than John Deere. Apparently, that's only something you say in the corn belt if you've got a death wish. Despite the looks of disgust, Skeeter rolled in every Sunday to sit at a dusty booth and drink coffee that he damn near had to chew before he swallowed all to spend a few minutes in the company of the prettiest woman he had ever clapped eyes on. Yancey took a newspaper as they passed the counter, and as they filed past the booths occupied by the regulars, he noticed that just about everyone was leaning over the newspapers laid out on their tables. All of them were reading something that must have been pretty damned interesting. Hell, Charlie Dietz and his bunch of cronies didn't even look up to give Skeeter their usual look of disdain. The boys slid into a corner booth at the back of the room. Skeeter sat up straight and adjusted the collar on his third favorite western shirt while the others were having a conversation about dying washers or crying tossers or some such prattle. But Skeet's mind had left the building. He found himself on a warm, sunny beach lying beside the living Madonna that was Lana. He gazed softly into her green eyes, or were they blue? Hell, they might have even been brown. Anyway, he was about to make his patented, There's something in your eye move, when without being invited, a very large cloud rolled in and cast a shadow over the adoring couple. Skeeter blinked himself back to reality and looked up to see who was casting the shadow. He looked up further and further, and just when his neck was about to snap, he met eyes with Roy Lee Kershaw, the busboy. Now, Roy Lee was what you might call big. That is, if you're in the habit of calling mountains anthills. The mass of humanity smiled down and asked, uh, Can I take your order? He wore the same barbecue and grease-stained tank top that he always wore but today he had on a red and white checked apron that almost covered his belly button. Skeet almost asked the big man if he ate Lana, but on second thought he decided he liked having a full set of teeth. He leaned forward and looked around Roy Lee toward the counter. Oh, uh, where's Lana? Roy Lee scooted Skeeter over and squeezed into the booth. Uh, uh, you haven't heard? Skeeter shook his head. I guess not. Uh, two days ago, her daddy disappeared right out of his bed, Roy Lee said, tapping the front page of the paper. People have been disappearing all over the county. A picture of the mayor's son in his football uniform was surrounded by an article. Yancey tilted the paper and read aloud. Police and FBI investigators are baffled by the disappearance of more than a dozen citizens in the Lexington area. No clues have been... Delights, James interrupted. No one is safe until the lights go away, amigo.
That night, another storm blew in, and again Yancey found himself being chased through a rain-soaked jungle by something hidden in the dense foliage. He awoke to find the window open and the curtains whipping in the gale, even though he had closed and latched the window before turning in. When he sat up, the night table at the corner of the bed toppled over, and a dark figure blurred past him and dove for the window. Yancey leapt for the intruder, but it was too late. His mystery guest had made his escape. Yancey slipped on a puddle of water that had collected under the window and floundered on his back until he found his bearings in the dark. He rolled to his knees, then stood up and felt his way to the door and groped for the light switch. When he found it, he flicked it up. Nothing happened, so he flicked it down and up again several times, the way people do for some reason but the result was the same every time. No power. He skulked his way to the kitchen and fumbled through the utility drawer. Rubbing it past the compact but powerful LED light, often instead for the large heavy mag light that everyone knows can be used as a beating stick in an emergency. He clicked it on and a brilliant white light flooded the kitchen. Making a slow circle and not finding any more uninvited guests, Yancey took a few deep breaths, and his heart rate dropped by about 20 beats per minute. With his adrenaline rush fading, he went back to the bedroom, replaced the nightstand, closed the window, making damn sure it was latched, then opened the closet door. He pushed aside the row of t-shirts that were concealing a massive gun safe. Inside the safe was a large assortment of firearms to choose from. Yancey's hand hovered over the selection. The rifles had plenty of knockdown power, he thought, but they were bulky, not suitable for close quarters. The larger pistols still had the knockdown power, but now that he was over the whole fight or flight mode, he began to think more rationally. Do I really want to kill somebody? Besides, think of the mess I'd have to clean up. Then he spotted the perfect weapon. He reached to the back corner and pulled out the old 410 shotgun he had had since he was a kid. Holding it again brought back fond memories from decades past, when after watching a certain biker movie that just about everybody over the age of 45 has seen, he cut down the barrel and stock to look like the one the star of the show used to blow away all the bad guys. He remembered thinking how cool he'd look packing around his own sawn off shotgun and the thing did look pretty gnarly. Then he took his super cool shotgun out pheasant hunting and realized why the actor called it a scatter gun. The thing sprayed such a wide pattern it wasn't safe to hunt with. When he got back to the house with no birds, his dad asked, So what'd you learn, boy? Red-faced, Yancey answered, Um, to think before doing stupid shit? Who would have thought that after 30 odd years of collecting dust, this would be the weapon of choice? Yancey brought a kitchen chair into the bedroom and sat in a corner, keeping a vigilant eye on the window for the rest of the night. At first light, he put away the gun and drove to Skeeter's place. After telling him what happened, Skeeter smiled and said, I got just what you need. They walked out to Skeet's tax shed and there hanging on the wall between the bridles and halters was the biggest, meanest, God help us bear trap Yancey had ever seen. Holy shit, Yancey exclaimed. I want to catch it, not kill it. Don't worry, I filed the teeth down, Skeeter reassured him. It'll still break bones, though, so don't step in the damn thing. They took it back to Yancey's and sprayed the moving parts with WD-40 before lugging it into the house and setting it under the window. Skeeter put a hand on Yancey's shoulder to steady himself and stepped on the levers. As the springs compressed, the rusty jaws fell open. Then Yancey used one coat hanger to raise the pan and another to set the notch. Skeeter carefully took his weight off the levers and stepped back. And that's all she wrote, he said triumphantly. Uh, not yet, Yancey said. Pulling the sheet off the bed, he handed two corners to Skeeter, and they gently draped it over the trap. Now the bitch is done writing. That night, Yancey dreamt of happy, fluffy sheep jumping weightlessly over the bed. 
He didn't bother counting them since he already knew how many were in his herd. The next morning, he was awakened by a high-pitched and extremely annoying horn blaring from the driveway. He got up and nearly stepped to the window before remembering the surprise on the floor. Admonishing himself under his breath, he pulled on a t-shirt and walked around to the front door. Abe and James sat in the side-by-side beckoning. Yancey could tell in a glance that something was wrong. He climbed in and they rode to the south pasture in silence. What the hell? He found himself muttering as they pulled up to the grisly scene. We found it like this a couple of minutes ago, Abe said, getting out of the side-by-side but keeping his distance. Yancey took a pair of gloves from the toolbox and slipped them on. Then, taking two handfuls of wool, he rolled the carcass over and stood back to inspect the contents, or more accurately, the lack of contents. The hide had been splayed open in one clean slice, and the stomach cavity was completely eviscerated. The bones have been stripped clean, James said, the fear evident in his voice. They look like they have been bleached or something. He stepped behind the side-by-side and retched. And where is the blood? Abe asked. Yancey dropped the gloves on the ground, pulled out his phone, and dialed 911. After explaining the situation to a dispatcher, they followed the fence line around the field while waiting for the cops to show up and found two more sheep in the same condition. You guys notice how the other sheep stay away from the dead ones? Like, way away, I mean, James asked. Maybe we should do the same, amigos. Maybe some kind of radiation is what bleeds their bones, Abe suggested. An ominous feeling of danger had Yancey glancing over his shoulder at every strange noise. On a whim, he called Skeeter and asked if he checked his herd of cows that morning. The phone was silent for several seconds, then Skeeter came back pensively. I'm looking at a dead second-year steer right now. He started to ask what the hell was going on when Yancey spoke over him. Stay away from it. The panic in Yancey's voice made Skeet freeze in place while Yancey told him about his dead sheep and that the cops were on their way. Skeeter drove to Yancey's place and showed up just before the cops. He parked inside the gate and closed it after a patrol car, an unmarked SUV, and a blacked out utility van came through. The patrol officer looked pretty standard issue except for the tightness in his uniform around the chest and biceps area. The man that stepped out of the SUV, however, was anything but standard issue. In fact, he looked more like the latest Bond villain. His finely tailored suit looked more painted on than worn over his slender physique. The ultra-black hair, styled in what had to have been a hundred-dollar haircut, seemed to be screaming, look at me while the disdainful scowl that was poorly concealed beneath his tightly trimmed goatee seemed to be asking, what the fuck are you looking at? Skeeter thought to himself, I'm definitely gonna fuck with this dude. Then the doors on the back of the van swung open, and a couple of space cadets stepped out fully clad in bright red biohazard suits. (laughs) Welcome to Earth! Skeeter laughed. He was too far away for the NASA rejects to hear him, which was okay, since neither of them looked like the humorous type. Skeeter walked up and joined his three amigos who were answering the officer's questions. What's up, Punch? He said, reaching out for a fist bump. The officer looked despondently over the rim of his glasses. Whoa, cold vibe, Skeet said, lowering his fist. Uh, Officer Bright was just asking us a few questions, Yancey said, his cheeks beginning to flush. Oh, yeah? Well, I've got a few questions for Officer Bright. Like, what's the square root of 372? How many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Pie? And what have you been up to since Chips got canceled? The officer cocked his head like a dog listening to a phonograph. Skeeter went on. Or... Why doesn't your cruiser say what jurisdiction it's from? Why are you packing that cannon on your hip instead of a police-issue firearm? And why these X-Files rejects didn't show any identification? They didn't even ask where the carcass was. They just pulled right up to it, James said. 
Now that Yancey was up to speed, he was itching to throw in his two cents. You know, it's kind of funny, he said. The officer turned back to him and cocked his head the other way. Yancey turned to Skeeter and cocked his head mockingly. This is a sheep ranch, right? Yeah, Skeet agreed. Well then, why am I smelling so much bullshit? With that, the four men walked around Officer Bright, or whoever he really was. He made a futile attempt to stop them, but knowing that he had lost all authority over them, he gave up. Leading the small congregation of pissed-off rednecks, Skeeter almost made it to the intergalactic spacemen who were scooping up the few remains of the sheep and putting them in a plastic bag when Mr. Handsome stepped in his path. That's close enough, he said authoritatively, raising one hand chest high like he was directing traffic and drawing back his jacket with the other, revealing a shoulder holstered Glock. The congregation stopped and Skeeter smiled amiably. Well, hey there, Slick Willie. You're just the suit I wanted to talk to. The officers should have warned you. This area is off limits, the suit said judiciously. I tried, Ponch said, taking a defensive stance alongside the man in the dark blue. Well, Skeeter said, turning to give the congregation a wry wink. I've got a few questions. The suit's eyes narrowed. First of all, Skeet said, still smiling all friendly-like. Where'd you go to get that haircut? Before Mr. Handsome could reassert his authority, Skeet continued. No, really. I've been thinking about changing up my look a little bit. To impress Lana, the suit asked. Even though Skeeter's smile didn't waver, he was on the verge of losing his cool and was starting to measure the distance to the man's jaw. Now why in the hell would you waste your time watching an old cowpoke like me? We watch everybody, was the suit's cold reply. Okay. Question number two. Mr. Bolin. The suit cut in, his voice barely raising in volume. We really don't have time for this. Okay, let's cut the shit, pretty boy. Skeeter's smile was nowhere as friendly as it had been. I want to know why my boy here called the sheriff's office and the cast of Marvin the Martian showed up instead. Let's just say we have jurisdiction over local law enforcement agencies. The suit's calm demeanor was playing on Skeeter's last nerve. So what? You're a Fed? CIA? Homeland Security? I know you're not the guy that delivers my mail. The suit reached for his breast pocket, or the Glock. Either way, Skeeter's revolver blurred from its holster and was pointed between the man's eyes before he had time to blink. Slow down, Sonny Jim. Let's see that hand. The suit slowly pulled his hand out from behind his lapel. You just made the biggest... The Mr. Man started to say when Skeeter's finger that had been resting on the trigger guard slid over the trigger. The man, who had been trained to take charge of any situation, felt his sphincter tighten. Skeeter snarled. You've got to the count of whatever number I decide to start squeezing to be out of range. The suit turned to leave. Wait a minute, Skeet said. You never did tell me where you got that haircut. That afternoon, Skeeter and Yancey went to the sports store and bought half a dozen trail cams, a roll of mechanics wire, and a handful of Slim Jims. On the way home, Yancey struck up a conversation about aliens. Since they had never had cause to discuss the subject till now, neither man really knew the other man's opinion. Yancey, as it turned out, fell in the firm believer category and knew all the talking points to fall back on. Billions of stars. Humans were too dumb to build pyramids. Crop circles. Area 51. Anal probes? Skeeter added. Okay, that one's got me baffled, Yancey conceded. Now here's what I think. Skeeter drew in a deep breath. The crash at Area 51 was a hoax orchestrated by the government to pique the interest of taxpayers so they wouldn't bitch about billions of dollars going to the Apollo space program. Yancey inhaled deeply. What about all the documented sightings of UFOs around the world, not just in modern times, but from thousands of years ago? Remote tribes in Africa, Asia, North and South America, all saw flying objects that couldn't be explained. 
I think you might be watching a little too much History Channel, partner. Besides, Skeeter filled his lungs to capacity. Anything sailing through the air is an unidentified flying object until you figure out what it is. When Walter Morrison was testing the first frisbee, over a hundred people hid in their basements, thinking the Earth was being invaded by aliens. Well, that's a nice shade of blue, Yancey said, pointing at Skeet's face. But I'm going to have to call bullshit on that one. Okay, I made that one up, Skeet said between gasps. The back and forth could have gone on for hours, or until one of them passed out, but there was shit to be done. Skeeter and James put up three of the cameras at his place, while Yancey and Abe hung up the other three at his place. One pointed at the driveway, another one pointed at the gate to the south pasture where the majority of his sheep grazed, and the last one they mounted on the side of the bunkhouse facing Yancey's front porch. Then they fired up the old backhoe. They dug a deep hole in the hilltop where the dead livestock had been buried throughout the years and dumped the carcasses in. Yancey even scraped up a few inches of topsoil where the remains had been found and dumped it in as well before backfilling the hole. Other than the usual ranch duties, the rest of the week was pretty uneventful, and when Saturday rolled around, the crew was excited to meet up at Skeeter's place to sample his latest attempt to recreate some online recipe he had found. Yancey's contribution to the soiree never wavered. Two bags of chips, dip, dessert from the bakery, and a cooler filled to the brim with beer and ice. James and A brought good conversation and healthy appetites, all to make us for a good night. Somewhere between half past the monkey's ass and a quarter to his balls, the drunken disorderly bunch of yahoos got up to leave, each casting furtive glances to the north, but the strange lights were nowhere to be found. A short time later, Yancey's weary head nestled into his pillow, and a vision of sheep leaping a three-bar fence lulled him to sleep. In the early morning hours, a droplet of rain pinged off the tin porch roof. Another followed, and another, and there was a rumble of thunder off in the distance. As the storm intensified, Yancey turned over and over, arms and legs becoming tangled in the bedsheets. Unconscious claustrophobia evolved into full-blown panic as the sheep in his chaotic nightmare became tangled between the rungs of the fence, with more sheep leaping to the top of the growing mound, crushing the ones that came before, until the fence collapsed with a resounding snap. Yancey woke with the horrifying realization that the cacophony of crushed sheep was actually the agonized cries of something caught in the trap. He twisted and pulled until the sheet released its hold on one arm. All the while, the thing near the window writhed in agony. Planned or not, it backed to the window and toppled out, dragging the cumbersome steel trap behind. The trap fell with a weighty clank on the wooden porch, and the creature bellowed an ungodly shriek. The bed sheet fell in tatters to the floor as Yancey fumbled for the flashlight on the end table then the shotgun at the head of the bed. An unholy scraping noise came from outside. A milky beam of light followed by the gun barrel, then Yancey's head protruded cautiously from the window. The oblong spotlight gravitated to the source of the rhythmic noise. The trap made a deep clunk clunk as it scraped from one plank to the next. This was followed by a wheezing intake of air as the creature inched the upper half of its body forward. The pale gray torso of the creature had all the characteristic traits of an extremely tall, extremely slender human being. Stop! Yancey commanded, trying to add an air of authority to his quivering voice. The thing seemed to understand as it ceased its melodic progression across the deck. The rising and falling of its gaunt abdomen slowed. Then it raised its shoulder and peered over its back, locking its enormous saucer-like eyes on Yancey. Time throughout the universe seemed to stand still. No way. Reinvigorated, the creature turned and resumed its task of escaping. It drug itself down the steps and out into the downpour. 
Yancey crawled through the window and pursued the wretched creature into the storm's fury. Stop! he ordered again. This time the creature did not obey. Yancey raised his gun and fired a warning shot into the air. The thing stopped and with what must have taken all its remaining strength, stood to face him. James stepped out of the bunkhouse waving a flashlight up and down, left and right before shining the narrow beam on the back of the, well, let's just go ahead and say it, the alien. With frayed nerves, drenched and confused, Yancey asked, What do you want from me? Moving slowly, the alien raised a hand toward him. Suddenly the rain stopped. Not everywhere, just over Yancey, as if he had stepped under a roof, except he hadn't moved. Now the invisible roof was moving, and neither he nor the alien were being rained on, and soon the entire driveway and bunkhouse were covered. The alien rotated its hand so that its outstretched palm was facing up, then its absurdly long fingers curled into a fist. Yancey's pulse quickened. It's trying to communicate, he thought. Then, a single bony middle digit rose to full attention. In an instant, Yancey's subconscious chose the response that best suited his personality, and he smiled. A sudden burst of light flooded Yancey's brain. He squeezed his eyelids tight, but they were transparent. He covered them with his hands and saw the bones within dark silhouette. He screamed again, falling to his knees the searing beam permeating every fiber, every tissue. So this is what it was like to be a chicken nugget in the microwave. <coughs> then as quickly as the light had appeared, it was gone, along with the alien. The rain swept over him, instantly cooling his irradiated back. The screams internalized as a vicious migraine set in. Hands settled on his back. Are you okay? The voice seemed muffled. Yancey tried to speak through his clenched jaws, but it came out as nothing more than whimpers. Finally, he simply shook his head. The brothers pulled him to his feet and each put an arm over their necks. They led their stricken friend into the house and lowered him onto the couch. One of them pulled Yancey's t-shirt over his head and it was replaced with a warm, dry towel. Just before sunup, sheer exhaustion superseded the pain, and Yancey fell into a deep, almost comatose sleep. When he awoke, something felt strange. He reached up and felt bandages covering his eyes. Soft hands took his and gently pulled them away from his face. Don't touch, babe, a silky voice said. <sighs> Is that you, Skeet? He sat up and slid his legs off the bed. Man, some people will do anything for a sponge bath. This time it really was Skeeter's voice. Just should I put those bandages a few inches lower, Abe said. James, are you in here too? See, I'm here, boss. The worry in their voices was concerning. Take these bandages off, Emily, Yancey said, struggling against her grip. It's way too soon for that, she said, squeezing his hands a little tighter than usual until he calmed down. She had been his home health care nurse when he got his side sliced open by a rampaging hillbilly, and that turned into some kind of romance that they were still trying to figure out. But she was starting to wonder just how many times she was going to have to nurse this crazy-ass cowboy back to health. I'll tell you what, she said. It's about time to put some more drops in your eyes. Implying that he could find out then if he could see or not. She had Skeeter close the curtains while she removed the bandages and then the cotton swabs. There was a slight rustling that Yancey couldn't make sense of. Then all together the group counted down. Three, Three two, two, one. one. Yancey opened his eyes to a squint. As soon as the air came into contact with his retinas, the burning began, and he blinked rapidly to moisten them. Less concerned with the pain, he tried to focus his vision. 
Two white pasty apparitions took shape on the inches in front of his face. He swung his open palm in a wide arc. Yo! Skeeter howled, rubbing the instantaneous welt that appeared on his right ass cheek. Immature? Yeah, downright childish. Offensive? Yep, downright insulting if you're the sensitive type. But for the Skeeter Bolins and the Yancey Tannehills of this world, and you know who you are, that's the kind of shit that makes you giggle like a bunch of damn ninnies, you sick fucks. After four days of feeling like a rooster locked in a hen house, Yancey was allowed to go outside under the condition that he wore sunglasses. After a week, he was back to his old self again, and Emily went back to her apartment in town, despite Yancey dropping subtle hints all week about moving in with them. Her response was always, It'll happen, babe. Late one afternoon, Skeeter burst into Yancey's living room, laptop in hand, looking like he just scored some Credence Clearwater Revival tickets. Tannehill, check this out, he said, flouncing down on the couch. Yancey turned off the A-team and leaned up to the coffee table. The screen lit up and an old geezer leered out from the screen menacingly. The man was obviously in his late 60s or maybe even his early 70s, judging from the age spots and wrinkles, and yet the hair on his head and upper lip were kempt and onyx black. Uh, what's this, your younger brother? Douchebag, Skeeter said, scrolling down to a YouTube video link and hitting the play button. Lightning flashed across the screen as a theremin whined a haunting tune. A voice echoed, Are you a believer? And the old man's severed head appeared to float as if by magic and not by some cheap CGI program. Sounding eerily similar to a used car salesman trying to unload the VW Beetle parked out back, he talked about UFOs as if he came to earth on one of them. Yancey looked over and was surprised to see Skeeter staring at the screen, completely mesmerized. Dude, this guy sounds like a used car salesman. Keep listening, Skeet said, not taking his eyes off the screen. If you or someone you know have had a close encounter with an alien species, I want to hear from you. Email me at... You didn't, Yancey asked. Wanna bet? Skeet said, opening a second tab and ignoring Yancey's what-the-fuck look. So this guy, Professor, he scrolled down and found a name. Rosenthal is about the weirdest duck in the pond, but he seems to know his shit when it comes to UFOs. Yancey looked at the new image on the screen and read the overlay aloud. Conspiracy Con, Orlando, Florida, Friday, May 13th, 10 a.m. through Sunday, May 15th, 3 p.m. EPT. Skeeter scrolled down to the list of speakers with Professor Rosenthal topping the list and scheduled to speak several times throughout the event. Apparently, this guy was more of a big deal than Yancey had given him credit for. A gleaming glass and steel building stood in the background slightly out of focus. Skeeter scrolled down again, bringing up a map with directions to the event site. He sat back. I've got hotel reservations, VIP passes, and an appointment for a private meeting with Rosenthal. Skeet looked pretty damn proud of himself. I thought you said you were a firm non-believer. Skeet shrugged. Well, something's been breaking into your house, and the son of a bitch stole my bear trap. So aliens or not, sons of bitches must pay. He bared his teeth and snarled, making his upper lip quiver. Okay, Elvis, don't burst an artery. Orlando, here we come. This untimely trip to Florida would have to take the place of their annual hunting trip, albeit two weeks earlier. So Yancey stayed busier than a cat burying shit all week, getting everything squared away on the ranch. This was Skeeter's year to drive, and Yancey was mostly looking forward to the road trip. He hadn't been to Orlando since he was a kid, and they went on an FFA field trip to DB's Gator Farm which turned out to be huge fun right up until Timmy fell in the gator pond. Then shit got real. A 12-foot gator that had been sunning itself on the sandbar got a hold of Timmy's arm. He let out a blood-curdling scream, and before anyone else had time to react, the guy that called himself D.B. shimmied up on the top row of the barbed wire fence and bailed off, 
like the time Randy Savage took out Ric Flair with an atomic flying elbow. The big man came down hard and sprawled across the gator's back. Reaching one hand under its jaw and the other one around its snout, he pulled for all he was worth, but the gator just seemed to smile. Let go, you son of a bitch, D.B. bellowed. The gator's mouth slowly opened and Timmy scurried to safety. Everyone else gathered around Timmy, probably wanting to see the blood more than to make sure he was all right, but not Yancey. He watched the big man who just kicked the gator's ass. D.B. stood up rubbing his bruised chest and seeing the young man staring at him, smiled and said, I think that suitcase with teeth understood me. The next day at school, Yancey tried out for the wrestling team and the rest is history. The part of this trip Yancey wasn't looking forward to was Skeet's favorite mode of transportation. You see, even though Skeet had a perfectly good mega cab parked in his garage, he always insisted on rolling out his old 69 Chevy fleet side for traveling long distances. Nothing about the old beast made it comfortable to drive to town, let alone across three state lines. For one thing, clear back when they were teenagers, Yancey helped Skeeter put a six-inch lift kit under the already high-setting truck. Then they took it down to the donut shop and got some 38-inch mud bogger special slapped on it. After that, they had to keep their seatbelts on to keep from being thrown out the windows. This year would be different, though. Yancey was coming prepared. The morning of the big trip had arrived and Yancey was sitting on his front step finishing his morning coffee when a 9.5 on the Richter scale damn near shook the teeth out of his head. Skeeter rolled up, revving the dueled out big block 454 with gas ported piston rings, flat tap camshaft, high rise intake manifold, etc, etc. The thing churned out almost 400 horses and stopped at every gas station. Yancey Pertner had to stand on his tiptoes to reach the door handle. It was time for the big reveal. He threw in two extra thick seat cushions that he bought at the home and garden center the day before. Consider that an early birthday present, you spoiled bastard, he shouted over the fire-breathing dragon under the hood. Skeet raised himself up and slid the cushion under him, then sat with a satisfied smile. Yeah, my ass thanks you. He'd mounted one of those aftermarket GPS systems to his dash, and while Yancey threw his bags in the back, Skeeter punched in the address of the event center. Once Yancey made the ascent to the passenger seat, he asked, but Would it kill you to put some running boards on this thing? Oh, hell no, Skeeter scoffed. Well, this ain't your grandma's truck. He pegged out the tachometer and dumped the clutch. Luckily, the tires broke traction and spun, or the whole damn planet might have started spinning backwards. Once they got into Lexington, it would be smooth sailing on the interstate all the way. Now, I don't know if you've ever traveled I-45, but if you haven't, you might want to put it on your bucket list. Talk about some pretty scenery. The boys were loving every mile, but as the afternoon wore on, Yancey began to feel the effects of the open road. The hum of the engine combined with the vibration of the knobby tires and the added comfort of the soft cushion nullified his mind and he drifted off. On a long straightaway somewhere between Chattanooga and Atlanta, Skeeter was startled by a woman's sultry voice telling him in no uncertain terms to exit the freeway in one mile. Skeeter looked at Yancey expecting to see a look of confusion to match his own, but only found Sleeping Beauty probably counting sheep. Skeeter eased off the throttle and took the exit, just as Mary Ann had instructed. Yep, Skeeter decided the GPS voice sounded like Mary Ann. Give a guy a break. He'd been driving since 5.30 that morning. There wasn't much at the bottom of the exit, and Skeeter checked the screen again. Now an arrow pointed in a 90-degree angle to the direction they had been headed on the interstate. Turn right in 50 feet, Mary Ann said. Skeet made the turn and pulled off the road. Yancey Tannehill, this is your wake-up call, he said, doing his best podcast narrator's voice. Now Yancey was wide awake and looking around. 
After reassuring his old pal everything was copacetic, Skeeter drew his attention to the GPS and explained what Marianne had instructed. Well, maybe there's construction up ahead, Yancey yawned. Tracing the detour on the screen, Skeeter said, It looks like this road comes back to the interstate in about ten miles. I guess that won't slow us down too much. When Yancey and Marianne agreed, they were off. Where the interstate ran straight as the crow flies, this byway seemed to wind around every prairie dog burrow and anthill. The top-heavy truck swayed around every corner to the point where Yancey was about to roll down his window and add some more color to the scenery. When Skeeter slammed on the brakes, sending the truck into a skid, and stopping just short of a flagman who was standing in the middle of the road holding a stop sign. Skeeter rolled down his window as the road worker approached. What's going on? They the buff water mean about half mile up, the burly man said. Probably be a few hours for the road up again. Skeeter laid his arm over the steering wheel and drummed his fingers on the dash. The flagman checked his sign and waved to another vehicle that pulled up behind Skeeter's truck. Then he said, There's a motel just around the next corner. Skeet considered the miles behind them versus the miles still ahead and the pain in the ass it would be to backtrack and try to find another route. He turned to Yancey, who had also been pondering their choices. Uh, I vote for the motel, I suppose. Skeeter turned to the flagman and asked, They'll definitely be done by morning? The flagman nodded confidently. Oh yeah, they'll have at least one ain't open. I guess we'll take the motel. Okay, well, you fellas have a good night, the flagman said with a smile and spun the sign to the side that read slow. Sure enough, when they rounded the corner, a run-down two-story motel with about half a dozen rooms on each level sat at the back of a gravel parking lot. The only other vehicle was a rusted-out Brady Bunch station wagon sitting on four flat tires. Skeeter pulled up to the lean-to style office and asked Yancey, uh, How many slasher movies do you think were filmed here? Uh, it ain't exactly the Ritz, Yancey said, looking the place over. The first thing that caught his eyes stepping into the office was the crappy orange shag carpet. A darker matted down path led to a desk that might have looked kind of nice back in its day. Skeet bellied up to the desk and rang the service bell. While they waited for a clerk who might or might not show up, Skeeter wandered to the left and Yancey meandered to the right admiring the pictures in the wood-paneled walls. If they were genuine, they should have been in the museum, since most of them were signed and probably worth a fortune. John and Robert Kennedy, Skeeter read aloud. Uh, here's one of Nixon shaking hands with Elvis, Yancey said. Neil Armstrong, Marilyn Monroe, Skeet said, getting more excited. Uh, hey, Skeet, have you noticed a little dude standing in the background of your pictures? Skeeter took a closer look, and sure enough, in every photo, an unassuming little man stood in the background, not waving or mugging for the camera. He was just sort of there. I wonder if his name is Waldo. Is that name is Heisenberg? A shrill voice said. Yancey nearly jumped to the ceiling, and Skeeter wheeled so fast his clothes were practically on backwards. Oh, I am sorry, gentlemen. The man behind the counter apologized with a sort of German-American blended accent. Without considering that it might be taken as rude, Yancey scrutinized the man, then looked back at several of the pictures, then back at the man who smiled. Yeah, that was me, many years ago. His hairline had receded considerably, and now he wore a pair of thin spectacles, but the eyes and the other features were the same. Did you know all these people? Yancey asked. Oh, yeah, the unassuming little man said. But that was another lifetime. He seemed eager to change the subject. So, what can I do for you, gentlemen? Skeeter started to say they needed a couple of rooms for the night when the old duffer cut him off. I must warn you, gentlemen, I do not sell motorbikers. He pointed to an almost invisible scar on his cheek. Skeeter's eyes narrowed. He knew quite a few bikers, and most of them seemed pretty decent fellers. He stepped up to the desk and looked at the little Deutsch bag gravely. Yeah, I've had dealings with bikers myself, he said in a low monotone. 
Yancey prepared for the worst as Skeet continued. I used to live across the street from one of those heathens. Back then, when I didn't know any better, I thought it might be kind of cool to ride a motorcycle. So I went over and introduced myself. He said his name was Big Turd and raised his sleeve. Was it? the Germerican asked. Yep, a tattoo of a big brown turd. Hell, it even had stink lines coming off it. He was a filthy, filthy man. Ja, they are all filthy, the German agreed. Skeeter went on. He offered to show me the ropes, so I bought one of those big touring bikes. And that weekend, we left his house before sunup. After five or six hours on the road, I was really starting to need a bathroom break. Just then, Big Turd stood up on his foot pegs and dropped his britches. No! The little man looked downright shocked. Oh yeah, Hindenburg, Skeeter continued. He sat down but slid his ass off to the side of the seat and relieved himself right there on the highway at 70 miles an hour. The man was barely human, Heisenberg exclaimed, pulling off his wire-rimmed glasses and shaking his head. Oh, but it gets worse. It gets worse? The more excited Herman the German got, the more his accent leaned to the German side. Skeeter went on. When he was done, he swung over to the other side of the road, still hauling ass. Dropped his hand to where it was just skimming the grass, and quicker than you can say Bob's your scary uncle, he snatched up a furry little cottontail. A rabbit? That's right, Heineken. He swung it around and swapped it right down his ass cleavage. Then, if that weren't bad enough, he bit the poor little thing's ear off and chucked it right out into the bar ditch. The little man shook with anger. He should be shot! At that point, Yancey had to turn away. How could a man be so cruel? Heisenberg asked. That's exactly what I asked when we finally stopped that evening, Skeeter said. What did he say? The German asked, hanging on Skeeter's every word. He told me we'd be taking the same road home the next day, and he'd hate to pick up the same rabbit. It was all Yancey could do not to explode with laughter. Heisenberg threw a key on the desk. Room number six is all we have available, gentlemen, the fuming little sauerkraut said. Skeet wondered if that meant the conversation was over. I would be alone, the little Hitler wannabe said, waving a dismissive hand. Yep. The conversation was over. Yancey went to unlock the room while Skeeter pulled the truck closer. When he walked in the room, his and Yancey's eyes met and they burst into laughter at the old man's expense. <laughs> the old man, still standing behind the desk, straightened his posture and rose about three inches in height. He pulled a cell phone from his pocket and dialed. They're here, he said with no hint of an accent, German or otherwise. Room six. Yes. Midnight. Understood. He ended the call and muttered under his breath, Fucking rednecks. There was no place to go and eat in this burg, but Skeeter, being Johnny on the spot, packed in a hot plate and a bag of groceries, and thirty minutes later, their bellies were bulging like a couple of bullfrogs at a fly convention. Before long, the back-and-forth farts and belches that followed a gourmet meal of biscuits and beans gave way to yawns, maybe some having to do with the amount of methane in the air. The boys hit the hay and Yancey covered his head. At around five minutes to midnight, the streamer that hung in front of the air vent began to flutter. A clear odorless gas filled the room, sending the flies, spiders, mice, and tenants into a much deeper sleep. The streamer stopped flagging and rested against the screen, and the sounds of the night fell silent. A slight vibration was preceded by a barely audible hum, and then at one second after midnight, a powerful wave of light bleached the color spectrum within its circumstance to white rice on a paper plate on Skeeter's ass cheek. Twenty seconds later, the beam vanished along with the occupants of room six. When Yancey opened his eyes, the room spun like a vote for Pedro button on a shithouse door at a Cajun barbecue. Whoa, he muttered. The light that shined down from the ceiling was dripping lava. He tried to touch it, but his hands wouldn't move. His head rolled to the left like a bowling ball, 
then back to the right, and he was eventually able to raise it slightly. The twisting kaleidoscope vision damn near brought up his supper, as six images became four, then two, and the room came into focus. Whoa, he repeated. Yancey hadn't done any experimenting with chemicals other than maybe a little mojo in college, if you held a gun to his head, but nothing had knocked him on his ass like this. Four dudes with giant heads wandered around the room bumping into each other and acting like their only purpose was to be seen. He noticed that one of them was dragging his foot like it had recently been caught in something. Uh, hey, what's up, alien dude? Yancey asked, waving a hand that was being held down by a leather strap. It didn't seem to notice him at first. Uh, hey, it's me, Yancey Hammermill. The alien with the limp turned slightly, then continued wandering about the room. Oh, uh, come on, I thought we were buds. One of the aliens pulled open a slit in the plastic partition and walked out, followed by the other two. But just when it looked like the alien with the limp was going to snub him, it turned back and hobbled to an IV stand. Paying no attention to Yancey, it pinched a hose that was feeding hallucinogens into Yancey's arm and slid a clamp over the kink, stopping the flow. Uh, hey, Yancey slurred. Uh, I need that. The creature hobbled to a stainless tray that sat on a stainless table and fumbled through the instruments with its comedically long fingers. Then it turned around, wielding a surgical scalpel. Uh, hey, why are you doing that? Yancey struggled as the alien came nearer. He had already developed a fear of knives, and now it looked like the fear was very rational. I thought we were pals, Yancey whimpered. The alien straightened Yancey's fingers that had been balled up in a fist and placed a thin rectangular handle in his palm, then closed his fingers around it. With no sigh of emotion, the alien turned to leave. It might have just been the drugs talking, but Yancey thanked the tall gray space being, then told it its head was melting. With the drug supply cut off, Yancey's head began to clear. He fumbled with the knife, working it under the strap. Then working it back and forth, he cut through the strap and his hand jerked free. He cut loose the strap that lay across his chest and then the rest. With that done, he removed the tape that held the IV in his arm and watched the plastic tube slip out of his vein, saying, You guessed it. Whoa. He slid off the bed and landed on the floor like a newborn lamb. As he rose to his hands and knees, a flimsy hospital gown that had been loosely draped over him slid off, leaving him naked. He gathered it up and, using the bed to steady himself, got to his feet. Taking deep breaths to clear the cobwebs, he saw that the walls were simply clear plastic that hung from the ceiling, and the bed he had been laying on was actually a stainless steel slab. Uh, no wonder my ass is so cold. The distant sound of rustling plastic snapped him to attention. This was no time to be sitting around sucking snot. He tied the gown around his waist, making sure his crack was covered, and peeked through the slit in the plastic. There was a hallway about ten feet across with about ten plastic rooms on either side. And at the end of the hall, an exit sign hung over a set of double doors. There didn't seem to be anyone around, so Yancey squeezed through the slit and padded down the hall to the next room. It was identical to his except an elderly lady lay on this table enjoying her drug-induced trip. She didn't like it any better than Yancey had when he removed her IV. But he didn't have time to pacify the old gal, so as soon as her bonds were removed, he moved on. Yancey recognized the young man in the next room. He was the high school quarterback that he had seen in the newspaper article. None of these people seemed to have anything in common. At the seventh or eighth room, Yancey was surprised to see an alien lying unconscious on the floor. Skeet raised his head, and seeing Yancey's head peeking in, said, Hey, Tannehill, I got an itch I can't seem to reach. Would you mind? Somehow, Skeeter had gotten a hold of the hose and yanked the IV out of his arm. Yancey stepped over the grave feller, and while he unfastened the straps, asked, What happened here? I whispered. You whispered? 
I whispered like I had to tell it something. Then when it leaned over, I headbutted the son of a bitch right in the chest. Oh, uh, yeah, Yancey stammered. Uh, that's what I did, too. These fuckers might be smart enough to fly across the galaxy, but I think this one must have been the janitor. Yancey brought Skeeter up to speed while they released the last of the abductees. Some laughed while others cried, asking where they were and saying they just wanted to go home. Yancey ran to the door and cracked it open, expecting to see daylight, but was disappointed to find instead a dimly lit tunnel. The long curving tube was painted a dull army green with a flat gray cement floor. A couple of men dressed up like army soldiers stood at ease in front of a door 30 feet further down and on the opposite side of the tunnel. Yancey quietly closed the door. Skeeter had snuck up and was standing beside them. Yancey whispered, There's two guards out there. Well, hell, Skeeter said, full-voiced. Sounds like what we need is a diversion. He reached not two feet from the door and pulled down the T-handle on the fire alarm. Yancey's eyes bulged as the alarm sounded. They gathered up their flock of confused tweakers and herded them to the exit. Stick close to us, Yancey said. Are we going home? An elderly man asked. Uh, your last name wouldn't happen to be Franson, would it? Skeeter guessed. Uh, Daryl Franson. The old man smiled and put out his hand. Skeet shook it and said, hey, Your daughter's gonna be glad to see you. Can we do this later? Yancey asked. He swung the door open and would have led the way into the tunnel if G.I. Joe hadn't been standing right in front of him, craning his neck to look Pee Wee Tannehill in the eye. Yancey slammed the door and leaned against it. Oh shit, this guy's a giant. Skeeter pushed him away from the door and swung it wide open. He looked up with a toothy grin and asked, uh, Which way to the gift shop? The soldier raised a hand that looked to be about the same size as a catcher's mitt and reached for Skeeter's throat. Skeet paddled back, leading the big man into the room. I didn't know they made uniforms that big! When the hulking giant smiled, Skeeter leaned into an overhand right that collided with the jolly green giant's jaw. Son of a bitch! Skeeter hollered, shaking his pulverized hand. Yancey pulled a fire extinguisher off the wall and was about to try his luck when old Mr. Franson stepped in front of the human skyscraper and delivered two quick punches to his solar plexus. The old man, not seeming quite so old anymore, circled the stunned soldier and drove a fist into his kidney, then raised his foot and thrust it into the back of his knee. The soldier dropped to his knees, groaning in pain. Mr. Franson asked Skeeter if he had ever heard two turtles fucking as he removed the soldier's helmet. Skeeter winced with sympathy as the helmet slammed down against the soldier's skull. And yes, if you were wondering, it did sound like a couple of turtles making love. The big feller's shoulders slumped and he toppled face down to the floor. Yancey put down the extinguisher and he and Skeeter gaped at Franson. In return, Mr. Franson raised the sleeve of his gown and pointed to the tattoo of an anchor and ship's name on his shoulder and the U.S. flag on his upper arm. Yeah, the colors that never run, boys, he said proudly. Skeeter rubbed down the goosebumps on his arms. Yancey pulled the pistol out of the soldier's holster and took two extra clips from the pouch on his belt. Well, let's try this again, he said, and one by one they skirted the big man's body and walked cautiously into the tunnel. There was a mass of confusion as soldiers ran from door to door looking for a fire that didn't exist, while a group of aliens walked quickly in single file down the tunnel. For no reason in particular, Yancey decided to follow the aliens, and they were off. After following the gentle curve of the tunnel for 30 or so yards, the walls and ceiling started to brighten, and then the light source came into view. A set of massive double doors sat open to the outside world. Yancey fought the urge to run, feeling an almost instinctual sense of loyalty to this group of strangers. When they emerged, the sun seemed brighter than it had ever been, and Yancey held up a hand to shade his eyes. A few feet past the doors, the cement floor turned into a graveled yard. 
The aliens that they had followed out of the tunnel were climbing into a long green army bus. Another bus sat unoccupied beside the first one, and a tan Humvee was parked off on its own in the middle of the yard. A high chain-link fence formed a barrier between the manicured property and the mountainous pine forest that surrounded it. A yard shack stood at one side of the double chain-link gates. Skeeter, suddenly standing beside Yancey, asked, Are you ready for a jailbreak? Yancey shook his head and said, Hell yeah, let's blow this popsicle stand. Skeeter turned and asked Mr. Franson if he knew how to drive a bus. The old man smiled and said, I'll drive a fucking ham sandwich if it gets us away from this shithole. The bus with all the aliens in it rolled out, but instead of heading for the gate, it wound back and disappeared behind the pines. I step into a chorus of vouches and shits, the barefoot abductees crossed the yard and filed into the bus. Yancey and Skeeter waited till last, helping the older folks climb aboard. They turned and were suddenly dumbstruck when an actual no-shit flying saucer slowly ascended from behind the mountain. A top disc rotated clockwise, and a lower disc that made up about a third of the bottom of the saucer rotated counterclockwise. The thing was huge. Skeeter rounded the front of the bus and bounded across the yard. Where are you going? Yancey hollered, running after him. Reaching the Humvee, Skeeter threw the driver's side door open and climbed over the seat. Suddenly, a gray came running out of the tunnel, and seeing that he had been left behind, turned and spotted the Humvee. When it started running toward them, Yancey raised his pistol, but the alien kept coming. The last thing Yancey wanted was to start an intergalactic war, but finally he decided there was no other choice. He pulled the slide back, released it, aimed and pulled the trigger. Sparks and smoke fizzled out of the 9mm hole between the alien's eyes. It stopped momentarily, put its arms out like Frankenstein's monster, and advanced again. The alien's head disintegrated. Yancey took his fingers out of his ears and looked up to see Skeeter wearing a set of earmuffs and a huge grin standing behind a turret-mounted 50 caliber machine gun that was mounted on the top of the Humvee. To Yancey's shock, the alien sat up, feeling for its head, but only feeling a smoldering stump rising up from its shoulders. It stood up and started wandering aimlessly. Aliens my ass, Skeet hollered. Yancey spent the rest of the clip making the imposter dance before it kind of ran serpentine headlong right into the only pine tree in the yard. Must be that janitor again, Skeet laughed. He raised the barrel of the gun. Cover your ears, he hollered, before unleashing Hell's fire. The flying saucer didn't seem to be affected at all as sparks flew where the bullets ricocheted off the metallic surface. Skeet adjusted his aim until the barrage of lead hit the seam where the top and bottom of the saucer counter rotated. A sudden shower of sparks rained down and the massive disc began to wobble like a skirt on a hula dancer. Now that he found the saucer's weak spot, Skeeter fired relentlessly until with a wrenching clatter, the bottom disc stopped rotating counterclockwise and started rotating in the same direction as the top disc. The saucer began losing altitude. Skeeter stopped firing and waved a hand over the smoking barrel. What? That some bitch is hotter than the French whore on Dollar Day! He looked down and saw Yancey pointing at his ears. Skeet took off his earmuffs and pulled the plugs out of his ears. Yancey held an imaginary microphone to his mouth and said in a high-pitched, nasally kind of voice, This is Yancey Tannehill, your action news reporter, coming to you live on the scene here at the secret military base. Pardon me, sir, did you see what happened? He dropped the mic and turned 180 degrees. Skeet wondered if his old pal was having a bad reaction to the drugs. Then, in a slightly lower tone, Yancey said, yeah, I did. I was running around trying not to get my ass shot off when I saw him standing there on top of the army truck, nightgown flapping in the breeze. I hollered, Don't look at them! But it was too late. She had already caught Skeeter fever. Yancey pointed to the tunnel entrance and Skeeter spun around. 
The blue-haired old woman stood frozen in place, taking in the show. Skeeter yanked his robe shut and climbed down to the driver's seat. He couldn't remember where he had heard it, but he repeated the phrase, Downright undignified! Yancey trotted over to the old woman and carefully scooped her into his arms. Was that new diamond? She asked in a frail voice. I saw him in Las Vegas last year. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'll try and get his autograph for you. He put her in the bus and Mr. Franson helped her to a seat. Skeeter pulled the Humvee around and as soon as Yancey's ass hit the seat, Skeeter gunned it. They were doing 60 when they hit the gate. You know in the movies when a car plows through a gate and the people inside the car jiggle like they ran over a dead possum? Well, my advice is don't believe what you see in the movies. The impact instantly slowed the Humvee down by about 30 miles an hour. And if it hadn't been for Skeet's quick reflexes, they probably would have ended up upside down in the bar ditch. Skeeter and Yancey watched in the mirrors as the bus flew past where the gates had just stood. That old man's hell-bent for Kentucky. Just then, a massive orange and black fireball mushroomed into the sky from behind the mountain. A few seconds later, the trees swayed violently and the earth shook, raising the dust off the road. Yancey watched the plume continue to rise and sincerely hoped his new friend wasn't in that ship. A mile further up the road, they came to a T. Which way? Yancey flipped an imaginary quarter and caught it, slapped it on the back of his hand and took a peek. Left. Skeet didn't bother questioning his logic. The road wound down a switchback until they were below the tree line and then straightened. A gas station appeared out of the blue and Skeeter darted into the empty parking lot. He wasn't sure the place was open until he tried the door and it swung wide open. An old man eyed Skeeter and Yancey suspiciously as they walked up to the counter. Cooey! <laughs> Y'all must escape from the know-how, he said, rolling off a heavy Cadian Creole dialect. No, just here be the latest fashion, Skeet said. Y'all got some kind of road map up in here? The old man threw a map on the counter. Hmm, that'll be a tool in a fit of nonsense. Skeet looked at Yancey. Now what? Yancey ran out of the store and returned a half a minute later, packing the last 450 caliber shells. He stood them on the rims on the counter, then went and got a case of bottled water and packed it up to the counter. The old river rat turned the shells over, and seeing they were the real deal, smiled and said, Yeah, doggy! Looks like you got the deal! Yancey took the water, and Skeet took the map, and they headed for the door. Ha <laughs> ha! Y'all come back now, you him! The old son of a catfish said. He watched the two men on the monitor screen under the counter as they split up, one walking back to the Humvee, and the other one taking the water to the bus. He went to the door and locked it while pulling the cell phone out of his shirt pocket and dialed. They're here, he said, sounding like he must have come from back east somewhere, and definitely not from the deep south. That's affirmative, he said, and ended the call. When Yancey got back to the Humvee, Skeeter said, Guess where we are? Yancey shrugged. No clue, partner. Skeet pointed to a star on the map and said, The Smoky Mountains. In about 20 minutes, we ought to be in Gatlinburg. Yancey suddenly lit up. He'd been feeling like they were about a million miles from home, and here they were, practically in their own backyard. Well, hell, old timer, we'll be home in time for supper. He bailed in, and they were off again. In Gatlinburg, Skeeter pulled over and borrowed a phone from a nice lady walking her poodle on the sidewalk and called the sheriff in Lexington. Hearing the good news, the sheriff told Skeeter they'd be waiting at the Uptown Mall. After a few hours of steady travel, they picked up a police escort, and a little while later they rolled into a mall parking lot to a hero's welcome. Holy shit! Half the damn town must be here! They pulled up behind a deputy's truck and were instantly surrounded. 
But as soon as the mob saw the bus full of their loved ones, Skeet and Yancey were yesterday's news. Skeeter climbed out of the Humvee and watching the cheering crowds around the bus said, Kinda gives you a good feeling, don't it? Yeah, <laughs> I was getting sick of these assholes following us. Skeet noticed that an ambulance had backed up next to the bus and a couple of paramedics were examining the abductees. Hey, pard, I think I'm gonna get my wrist looked at, Skeet said, and they parted ways. Big crowds had never been Yancey's thing, so he took the Humvee and headed for the Hacienda. After poking and prodding his hand, one of the paramedics told Skeeter he should definitely get it x-rayed and was just wrapping it up for safekeeping, when who should come strolling up but the lovely Miss Lana herself. Without saying a word, she gave Skeeter the kind of kiss that made him wish he had on more than just a hospital gown. She turned around, feeling a tug on her arm, and was met with a slap across her cheek. Looking down about two feet, she met eyes with a blue-haired old lady. Keep your hands off him, you slut. Neil is my man. A deputy that had seen the whole thing, trying not to laugh, stepped in and escorted the feisty old broad away, kicking and squalling. Lana turned back to Skeeter and said, Looks like I've got some competition. In the meantime, Yancey had pulled up next to the bunkhouse and climbed down from the Humvee. Without hesitation, he walked over to the trail cam that hung on the wall and twisted the latches. The face cracked open a bit, and the familiar scent of burnt wiring caught him off guard. Damn it, he said, swinging the face fully open. The entire contents were melted into a twisted glob of fused plastic and metal. If there was a memory card still in there, it probably looked like he was feeling. Sons of bitches don't miss a trick. A vehicle came up the driveway and parked at the house. Yancey walked around the Humvee expecting to see James and Abe, but was pleasantly surprised to see Emily stepping out of her car. The little Ford's bumpers damn near drugged the ground under the weight of all the boxes and bags and the cedar chest that stuck halfway out of her trunk. Uh, you just come from a yard sale? Yancey asked, still crossing the yard wearing nothing but that sheet around his waist. Emily eyed him like she had been on a diet for three months and he was a cream-filled Yancey bar. Unwrapping him with her eyes, she asked, What you got on, cowboy? Uh, it's called redneck leisure wear, he said with a grin. It's all the rage down south. Then he asked her what she was wearing. Emily looked down and said, Just a blouse and some jeans? With a coy smile, Yancey said, I meant under that. Turning about nine shades of red, she said, well, There's only one way to find out. And she headed for the house. Yancey stepped up on the porch and turned to look the place over. Life ain't bad, he thought. A voice carried from the bedroom window. Tannehill, get your narrow behind in here. Hmm. Not bad at all. <laughs> You've been listening to Skeeter and Yancey vs. the Grays by Lynn Jenkins. A good reminder that when you smell bullshit on a sheep ranch, it might be just that. A little about the author. Lynn Jenkins is a retired oil field hand from Vernal, Utah. He writes to honor his older brother Jim, who was called back to his maker far too soon. Those lucky enough to have known Jim might recognize the resemblance to Skeeter Bolin, and that's because he's loosely based on Jim, so you can imagine the wild-ass adventures they had. You can find Lynn's books on Amazon Books, Google Play Books, and Apple Books. He thanks you for your support. And while you're at it, please remember to stop by our Apple Podcast page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and subscribe. The charts are based on subscriptions, not listens, by the way. So feel free to accidentally subscribe as many times as you want. I won't tell anyone, I promise. 
And if you feel like spreading the word and helping old Drew Blood out and convincing a friend or two to subscribe to my podcast, that would help me out greatly, and I'd really appreciate it. To hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all our other podcast episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the upper menu. You'll find yourself at chillintalesfordarknights.com where you can become a patron for as little as $5 a month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program and all our other shows and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there where you'll get all our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook and Instagram and sometimes Twitter. Sometimes. And remember, we're accepting submissions. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on this show, send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment. Well, I'm afraid this is where we part ways, friend. At least till next week. So grab a drink for the road, but behave yourself out there. Leave the gator wrestling to DB. Yeah, I caught that one, Jenkins. And Dingle says thanks for the dignified affirmation. Now, I know I usually shout out a couple of YouTube listeners, but right now, Drew Blood's battling a migraine. It hurts my eyes too much to try to read that screen and find those names, so the show must go on, so they say. I'm here, y'all. I'm here. So to all the YouTube community who support old Drew Blood, I thank you, and I love you. And may the wind be at your backs, and may the road rise up to meet y'all. Don't be as loud as two turtles if you can help it, but do go fuck yourself. <laughs> Good night, y'all. Ouch.
tales for dark nights.